Good evening and welcome. We're so glad you could join us here at Town Meeting TV's continuing coverage of the primary elections, which are coming up on the 11th of August. And that tonight we are talking with representatives for District 6-2, and this is in Burlington's New North End. And Gene O'Sullivan is the incumbent, and Emma Mulvaney Stanick is running also in the primary. So welcome. And I just would like to get right to the point and ask you, why are you running and what qualifies you for the position? Gene. Well, but I don't want to be rude. I'm doing a correction. New and old North End. And that's exciting because it's a really, it's a 50-50 district and it's fabulous. So I've had the honor, I've timed this, I've had the honor of representing you in Mount Pelia for eight years. I serve as vice chair of the House Commerce Committee. This is the committee that every pandemic relief and recovery program from the Department of Labor, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Department of Financial Regulations, Insurance and Banking Divisions originates. My leadership has brought you minority or women-owned business grants, COVID-19 hazard pay for frontline workers, COVID-19 workers compensation coverage, restart Vermont tech support to small businesses, restaurant and farmers feeding the hungry. I'm asking for your support to continue to be your voice in COVID-19 relief and recovery efforts. My 20 years of public service, first as city commissioner, then three terms as a city councilor, and now five terms as a representative has taught me a tremendous amount about fashioning good public policy. As a small business owner of over 32 years, I learned what it fosters successful small businesses. As a single mom of 42 years, I know how hard it is to keep a thriving family in good and bad times. My experience as a political activist in Mississippi proved to me that we have a caste system in this country. Successful public policy encompasses all of these factors. And that's what I bring to the table. And I'd love to return. Thank you very much. Emma Mulvaney Stanek, what qualifies you for the position and why are you running? Thanks, Lauren Glenn, and thanks for having this forum um, for folks. Uh, I'm running because I am ready to uh, run for elected office again. I'm a former Burlington City Councilor for two terms from the Old North End, and I've lived in the Old North End for almost 17 years now with my wife and two young kids who are under five. I'm an organizer, an activist, and a mom, as I said, and I think that gives me a unique perspective that, that really matches with not only folks in the district, but Vermonters throughout the state of real life experiences, um, trying to run a small business on my own. I'm now a consultant, but also raising two kids and navigating the world of uh, childcare, navigating the world of what will happen under COVID in the public school system right now. Um, and really living the experience of how do you make ends meet in Vermont when you are young folks trying to raise a family um, and in my case, run a business. And in my, in my wife's case, uh, work in public service. She works for the city of Burlington. So I've spent my professional life in economic justice. I directed the Vermont Livable Wage Campaign, where I was an advocate in the state house, working on minimum wage. Um, I've also worked for most of my career for a union, Vermont NEA, the, uh, the teacher and support staff union in the state. And it's given me a statewide perspective um, in terms of economic needs of Vermonters and education um, and communities. And I think that's another unique perspective to go to Montpelier and be ready to work in colleagueship with folks who are in rural parts of the state as well as um, in Burlington. So I have an urgency um, to really prioritize economic justice, uh, equity and education, and working on uh, justice for marginalized people in our, in our state. I don't know if you're, if you're calling time, Laura Glenn, sorry, I can't tell. <laughs> you're doing great. Great. Do you have anything else finally to add? And actually I want to segue to, mm -hmm. um, for both of you, what will be different because you've joined the legislature next year? So why don't you answer that? And then Jean can wrap that up. Great. Well, that, that's a great segue because I was also going to add that one of the other inspirations I have for why to run is it really matters when people impacted are at the decision making table. And so uh, I, I learned this on city council and I believe it as an activist and organizer that to really engage the community is the job of elected leaders. And back when I was on council, um, I, before it was Vogue, I was engaging um, a lot of constituents through Front Porch Forum. I attended neighborhood planning assemblies in the old North End when electeds hadn't really visited ever. I was reminded this of a, by a constituent the other day uh, who said, we had never really seen city councilors before you started showing up. And to poll and engage people so in all sorts of modes because people are busy. But I think for, um, in terms of 
the impact I would have on the on the district, it's a two-way street and it's one where I think decision-making benefits and improves when elected folks engage with their constituents, listen, learn, collaborate, um, and, and not only offer information about what's happening in Montpelier, but invite people in. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is when I advocated on minimum wage, I was surprised, and that's an understatement, how inaccessible that building really was for working people in a lot of committee rooms. And I really felt like I had to fight my way in, elbow whip my way in to make sure that people felt comfortable with testifying, that it really was the people's house. Um, and I think we could do more as legislators to really make sure that that's protected and that people feel invited and heard in the building. I keep unmuting because we have a, a pet, Gina Sullivan. <laughs> What's going to be different next year for you and for the legislature and for the district because you've gone back to the legislature? I have two very clear priorities. The first one is 100% of our, I, I, I really do, because I, I want to make sure people get this. 100% of our graduating seniors have literally no idea how to make a living. 75% of those kids don't go on, they go into post-secondary at best for six months. That means 75% of our graduating seniors hit the job market in under two years with no job skills whatsoever. We need to redo workforce development and marry it to education. And prior to COVID-19, I had over many years in house commerce working with leadership, convinced everyone that we need to redo career technical education, both K through 12, but right now we're working on low-hanging fruit, which is night school, VTC, and CCV. We need to marry and blend those programs and roll out a statewide tech program. What that would look like is, and what utility would be, we have no post-secondary culinary arts programs in the state except for NECI. If we do this, we have at least four commercial kitchens that go in, in the tech centers that could be used for serve safe and all of the upskilling of our hospitality workers. We had a consultant, we had money. The job was not to tell us whether we should, it was how do we roll out this statewide adult tech so that people could have, they could go to night schools and get a certificate or be part of the apprenticeship program and get better jobs and upskill because our workforce development in the state is segmented and all over the state with millions of dollars that are not worked very effectively. If we create that partnership and model it, we can then go to the K through 12. So that's one. Two is sexual assault in the military. And so can I just pause let, you? Yeah. Because we're at two minutes. Um, I'm sorry. Is this, no. Is this an aspiration or do you think, this is, sounds like it's a priority. Do you think you'll be able to move that issue by next year at this time? Yes. It's already done. What happened was, it took okay. years to do it. We had the money, COVID came, and that's what blew it up. But Got with it. the state college system failing, we have a real opportunity. All right, thank you, that's wonderful. I, the budget is really the next question because we have so many aspirations for what we want to accomplish, but the financial picture for the state is uh, looking bleak for the completion of FY20 and looking ahead at FY21. So I wonder, Jean, why don't you talk for a couple minutes about um, how you will, you know, what your approach would be is to budgeting and where the priorities are and how to generate the revenue. We absolutely, the one thing we know, any economist will tell you this, you cannot cut your way out of this. There's no way. You have to de deficit spend. The federal government has to deficit spend. We have to deficit spend. We have to hire Vermonters at sustainable wages in projects that work and build Vermont, i.e. building out broadband, housing, all of the things that we have deficits right now, and we, the state, have to come up with money partnering with the feds. That is the only way we're going to get out of this. You just have to put money into it. And we cannot allow the governor, who thinks he, cuts it, he can cut his way out of this, to do that. We can't. All right. And it's just, it's going to be brutal. It's going to be hard. But the Great Depression brought us minimum wage and um, social, security. social security. So look what we could get. Pay family leave. We could get business-sponsored child care. I mean, there's a lot of, in this, in this meltdown, 
I think there's a lot of moves, it's like unemployment for independent contractors. That pandemic, that PUA program, I've got the Joint Fiscal Office looking at it, of creating, and I don't think it's hard, it's already there, let's make a statewide unemployment program for gig workers, independent contractors, sole prop, and run it off of a small percentage of tax, like they do on a W-2, you do it on a 1099. So if Uber, I'm an Uber worker, my I, Uber pays me, and then they pay into, based on my 1099 earnings, unemployment. The I, I genuinely think these are very doable things. I know the state, I, I'm absolutely sure the state college, the night schools, and the um, CCV will, will happen, because that's already been decided. Thank you so much. Emma Mulvaney-Stanek, your approach to Vermont's budget conundrum. Yes. Well, I agree in large part with what Jean has said, because I think not only um, are there really sound economic policies can, we can do, it is the role of government to stabilize the economy. And that would actually be my, my priority as well going in, uh, not only because it's the reality, but I think we have a lot to do around modernizing our um, our social safety nets and the way that we look at supporting labor in particular. I've been saying similar stuff on the campaign trail around learning from what we've, we've expanded in COVID um, to really catch up with the way the economy works today. So expanding unemployment benefits yep. to reach every worker, including myself. Um, before COVID, uh, as a self-employed um, consultant, I would never be able to access that. And in an economic crisis, through no fault of these of folks like myself, you know, if clients dry up, it's a economic hardship, and it and it starts to slow down the economy rather than really supporting uh, local stabilization in our economies. Um, I also think it would we should look at things like the a solidarity tax. Um, when Snelling was governor, uh, it was something that was explored on a temporary basis to really increase yeah. revenue. We have to be smart around um, looking at the at the uh, budget with a people orientation and a way of, of a, a value of fairness. So people who can afford to pay more help to pay more, who have been less impacted by the economic um, downturn of COVID. And the wealthiest folks in Vermont are, are largely doing okay. They have been minimally impacted economically around COVID. And it's something I think we have to explore to make sure that we can stabilize our community. Plus with the Trump tax cuts, there's room, there's room there for people to be able to um, give more into um, stabilizing their, their local community. And I would agree that, that the role of government, especially with the way that interest rates are now, uh, should explore deficit spending. It is actually a smart and economically sound thing to do um, so that individuals and small businesses don't go into debt. Because if they go into, de into debt, they'll either go bankrupt um, or both individually and small businesses, or they certainly will not be able to hire back people uh, when people need it most to um, to be able to work in their communities again. So there's a lot the, the state can explore. And I honestly think that we should use this as an opportunity to be brave and creative like we can be in Vermont and to build off of things like the child care stabilization work that happened during COVID. Nothing like that happened in the country. And when Vermont can be brave and, 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 and work on some brilliant ideas to think outside the box, we can really be smart about naming what keeps our local economy thriving and that includes things like childcare and uh, and really supporting people how they work today and not based on old assumptions and old um, economic you know uh, standards that are were from another time. We work differently today and we need different supports. Can you segue into because you're partly discussing it the impact of COVID on the state and where the opportunities as well as the challenges are. You want me to go? Oh my, yes, back, back to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's hard to talk about anything without COVID. I mean, we're living we're living through an unprecedented time in all of our our lives here, and I do think that the biggest impact of COVID has been um, the job loss and job reductions in uh, for Vermonters, um, and also just the frontline conditions changing for essential workers. So people who are on the front lines, be it a grocery store or um, in a pharmacy, or those who are actually in healthcare. Uh, and I think, you know, we need to do more with our, our um, federal delegation to lobby for more money. Um, it's as much as I said about the state level de deficit spending. I agree with Jean. We have to also increase federal deficit spending to stabilize states. Yeah. Uh, we're interdependent. We're in this together. And we have to not only um, get more uh, resources to folks who need it, but it has to be focused on the people most impacted by COVID and not just blindly throwing out money in a trickle down economy kind of concept where 
we'll just give money to all these these big bigger businesses and bigger employers and as an afterthought be thinking about smaller employers um we we owe them more frankly and it's we know it's the small businesses that are the backbone of a lot of communities in vermont um and i think we need to uh, update, you know, really recommit to those those size businesses. The last thing I'll say about that is I also think it's an opportunity for us to live our values of challenging some concepts around um, pay discrepancies between those who are the, the the highest paid in businesses and those who are the lowest paid. And there's no other way to really uh, to start really combating things like the wage gap for women and the wage gap for um, uh, uh, black, brown, indigenous folks, um, people of color unless we actually start thinking around leveraging state dollars and investments. And so this is a big investment. It might be in a COVID context, but we can leverage um, some critical conversations around um, excessive gaps between those who are the executives of businesses mm -hmm. and those who are, who are literally making, um, making the business run and providing the services. So I think those are some things to think around as we try to grapple with the economic crisis for COVID. Yeah. Thank you very much, Emma. And Jean O'Sullivan, you want to follow up on the question of the COVID impacts on Vermont? You talked a little bit about some of the um, moving, you know, the ability to move on some things that have been long stuck. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, we have what has been very clear is our, we have an over-reliance on hospitality. And what we are going to face, because it's coming back at best to 25%, is we are literally going to look at thousands of displaced workers, which actually can be an opportunity. Because if one of the gaps in our state, pre and now post COVID, is there are thousands of jobs that go, go open and there aren't Vermonters to fill them because we don't have a skills gap to answer the jobs needed. And these are, you know, these are 50, 60, 70, $100,000 jobs, but we're not training, we're not educating. So our kids go out and other people come in and it, it, that system doesn't work. So workforce development is going to be a big part of it. And taking the thousands, and I'm literally saying thousands of displaced workers out of the service sector, moving them into upskilled, in, into an upskilled workforce plan like night school certifications, apprenticeships, and then developing other apprenticeships so that if you start out as a dishwasher, you can work through your certifications and get up to management. The guy who's the communications director for Skinny Pancake started as a dishwasher. So what we need to do is, if, if you're gonna be in hospitality, you've gotta have a step ladder up to the middle class or it's just non-functional. They just burn through people. At the same time, broadband is key. Broadband has gotta get expanded because that's what's holding back businesses. As Emma mentioned, the nature of work's changing. People are working remotely. They, more people would work remotely. Businesses are figuring it's cheaper to have them without the bricks and mortar anyway. But they can't, those folks can't move into the country and work because they don't have broadband. Broadband is crucial to economic development post-COVID. Absolutely crucial. And I think with workforce development and broadband, the other thing I really want to echo what Emma said, Celine Co Coburn and I are putting in a bill for the budget this year. It may not pass, we'll get it next year. We want all of the state programs only to invest in companies that have a between one and 10 ratio, highest and lowest paid. Veggie, Vermont Training Program, and Vita, the, the, the state, basically the state bank. I think we can put it in. Thank you very much. Do you have questions for each other? Jean, do you have a question for Emma? Um, we were chatting already, so I'm uh, not necessarily. Uh, I missed, I'm so sorry I missed it. Oh, it was, it was great, I, but... Um, I do want to talk about the question on gun on gun control for a second. Can you, yeah, can you put that in the form of a question? And then you can answer it. To herself well, or to me, just to clarify. <laughs> to you. To me. Okay. Okay. Oh no, I no, I, I actually I don't want it wasn't a question. I think we're on the exact same page because she was on the city council when we passed all the charter changes. Um I just all I want to say was that when we got our questionnaire, it talked about gun control and gun rights. Yeah, well. And the we can, yeah. we can talk, go ahead. Why don't you answer the question on gun rights? Where do you think we are as a state on the gun rights question? And are we going in the right direction? I think we're great on gun safety and gun responsibility. I think the, I think the whole discussion isn't about gun rights. I think the Supreme Court, I think it should have been a fully, you know, made militia. That being said, Supreme Court went in one direction. 
arguing the gun rights issue is not the issue. It's if you have a gun, you are responsible. You have to store it safely. And if that gun gets stolen, it's on you and you have a liability. And that waiting period will not only prevent suicides for handguns, but there is a very, very healthy trade of drug dealers coming up here, Vermonters buying guns and trading guns for, for drugs. And we, that's why we, we desperately need the waiting period and accountability for owners. And, the, and your puppy to- agrees. <laughs> and I was going to say, I would make it an easy segue if you have to be on mute, Lauren Glenn, one of the dog parts. I'm just glad that not one of my children have basically Zoom bombed me in my, because that has happened in, I swear, every forum so far. So, but I'll, I'll address the guns issue as well, if that's okay. Um, so Please. I think we have done, yeah, okay. Um, so I, I think we have done some good stuff uh, recently in Vermont around increasing background checks um, and making sure that law enforcement can remove guns in, in um, certain situations where there's been a domestic violence um, call to uh, to public safety. And there's more that needs to be done. As Jean said, we have to um, uh, institute waiting periods. It's not only a matter of, um, I think, common sense, frankly, that if someone who, who is able to possess something that could take someone else's life, it's it's one that will actually, as I, I think Jean was alluding to, really help with Vermont's suicide rate. It's, yeah. um, as we know, suicide is a, it's a violence of impulse and it, it will dramatically increase, or sorry, decrease, um, the uh, people's access to a gun in, in a moment when um, they're in crisis and need um, support in other ways. I, I think we, we need to remember that in Vermont, as if folks talk about um, guns and violence in general, yes, it's a generally safe place, but it's not if you are um, a victim of domestic violence. Um, you know, statistically half of all the homicides in Vermont are related to domestic violence, and most of those have a gun involved. So more reason to really use common sense around waiting periods and to balance our neighbors' safety and even family members' safety around people who um, are uh, in these really traumatic situations. Because it's frankly not just, let's hope that it never gets to a homicide level, but we know that guns are major um, pieces of intimidation and keep people in really violent and um, harmful situations. And if we can really be smart around controlling guns and removing them from those situations, it will be so beneficial to the health of our communities. You know, I have a sort of sideways question that you can say you would rather not answer because we didn't prepare it. But I was thinking about the national debt and I was thinking how we're spending our way through COVID and you're talking about that as a kind of economic policy. Does the the scale of the national debt trouble you in any way, Emma? <laughs> well, yes, being a new a newly minted four-year-old, my birthday was just last week. I have many years ahead of me, hopefully, in terms of living in this country and uh, and trying to really challenge the way that we've looked at budgeting that has really prioritized structurally things in our federal government that don't benefit the everyday lives of folks. I mean, my days at the Peace and Justice Center, we spend so much on the military, military industrial complex. It's unbelievable. When we look at F-35s, this is not you know completely related, but the amount of money that an F-35 alone, one of those planes costs, could fund how many schools, could fund how many repairs on roads, could fund how much health care for people. So when we think about the overall federal budget and then the money needed to kind of um, keep it uh, churning along in the federal uh, deficit, I think we have to make some structural changes um, in order to right the ship and to really uh, reprioritize people and not and not this, um, especially the military, but many other you know corporate bailouts, other pieces within how we sort of do, quote unquote do economic development and what supports our economy and what doesn't. So I think it's a whole big structural conversation. Thank you, Jean. Do you have an opinion on the scale of the national debt? Does it trouble you? The scale doesn't trouble me. It's the basic dysfunction in the economy. The income disparity, we are effectively in the 1890s with the land of the robber barons. What's happened now, because of the income, it all goes back to Reagan's tax cut. But you go to the income disparity, which then rewards companies to make more and more money with less and less money being paid out. And all of a sudden, that's where you start seeing economically, you see all of these supply lines extending because it's cheaper over here and I can bring it in here and I'm not going to pay taxes on all of my outrageous amount of income. And that what that has done is taken all of the all of the costs of government and put it squarely on the middle class and basically destroyed the middle class and then made middle class oddly say, oh, no, no more new taxes. But what you really need to do is go back up and tax the higher income 
and tax the corporations and also build a more sustainable economy. What they're saying are the, the uh, job creators back in the George Bush era, they're not job creators. They don't make jobs. They buy real estate and they buy investments. That's what they do. Job creators are the 40,000 independent contractors and independent small businesses in the state of Vermont. Small business creates the jobs. So we've got to, so I'm not worried so much about the, the net dollar of that because it's going to go way higher to get out of this pandemic that we're in. What I'm concerned about is, is the structure of the economy and changing the taxes so that it becomes sustainable. Thank you. We have four minutes left. So I'm wondering if you have a question for another person, um, I, th now would be a good time to ask it. Mm -hmm. Emma, do you have a question? For yeah, Jean? Jean, I'm sure. Um, Jean, I am wondering um, what your take on the idea of community engagement looks like. So what, what, what would you do to engage constituents um, if you're reelected? Voting. I think that it has, I think we have a phenomenal opportunity. You have meetings, half the people show up, no one's really interested. What happens, you end up doing, it's, it, you end up meeting, it's good, with various interest groups over a very narrow scope. And when people all vote, the discussion gets larger and more engaged because all of a sudden they put their, they, they made their choice and their choice is standing there. So they, now they want to talk to their choice. I think this is going to be key. I remember when NPAs came in and with Bernie and they were wonderful. And they started that engagement. And it was only, that's the only place I know of where you really have a group of individual people, different backgrounds, different everything. The only thing they've got in common is geography. And it's a wonderful thing. I think that by expanding the voting, we're going to see a whole new level of civic engagement. One of the things I talked about is 30, at one point, we had a 30% turnout for a mayoralty race. Mayors, city councilors, multiple millions of dollars in debt were being voted on by 30% of the people. And the other 70% said, oh, well, and they walked away. So it's, they've, they've got to buy in. They've got to have skin in the game. And I think that, I think that mail, I think mail ballots will change that. Thank you. Do you have a question for Emma? Um, uh, uh, um, um, a short well, what about what about what, because she's a mom and and her kids are going to go back to well one where are you with ages for kids you've got a baby and do you have a, do I have anyone a, going back I have to a kid school? Who, I have a kid who's turning one on election day on prime so don't tell him Shh, don't tell him I okay. probably won't be around on election day and the other one is uh just newly five and in starting kindergarten so okay. we haven't been in in school yet but we're headed to something question mark so so what do you think is what do you think is the best uh, what do you think that is the best option yeah, what, a great I mean, question. You're, you're living it. Yeah, it's an it, it, in many ways it feels like an impossibility, and it's um, it's interesting because because there was some questionnaire we both had to fill out, Jean. I, I have no idea if, uh, what what your answer was necessarily, but it was a forced choice around. Do you think schools should reopen? Question mark. Yes, no. That's your only option. Yeah, and it's really? such not it's such not a black and white question. And you know, I had to do the uh, the mental load of uh, and the worry mode as mom, as you know, back in June when our child care center reopened, and I'm on the board of the Robin's Nest uh, Child Care Center here in the Old North End, and the extreme anxiety about what do we know yeah. and what and what's the right choice because we cannot, our household could not handle the mental strain, and we're in a very privileged situation, mind you, of keeping two full time jobs going, working yeah. all weekend, all week, and then literally seeing tag you, see you later, wife, you know, I'm running to my job, you take care of the kids, because our kids cannot be alone by themselves. And so that was a very difficult situation. And we realized we have to do a couple things, trust science, trust, you know, the numbers, keep an eye on that, and know that this is a, a marathon, not a sprint. And so while there might be flattening of cases and growth of cases, we have yeah. to take it literally month by month and as a community. Um, and know that we're literally all in this together and need to practice, um, you know, safety uh, as well, as well as knowing that schools are the center of communities. There are so many people who do not have the privilege of, of education pods, right? Yeah. And, and, and kind of just um, opting out and financing um, private teachers. And so I think we have to work like this as a community, make sure that we're not losing the equity that public schools present when you're in a classroom together. And testing. I think, I really think, so, you know, I don't think it's safe unless you've got testing. Thank you. So this has been great and we could keep going and I'm sorry that we can't, but we are so glad to have the two of you, Emma Mulvaney-Stanick and Gino Sullivan from District 6-2.
and uh, competing in the Democratic primary on the 11th of August. And stay tuned here for continuing coverage of Town Meeting TV's primary election. And you can certainly watch us on 1087 on Comcast, 317 and 17 on BT, and ch17.tv, and of course, YouTube. Thank you very much.